People ask me what the best part of my job is, and you know, I love cutting and folding bell patterns to the point where I'll cut a million bell patterns, like, and then I'll fold them, and I won't braise them because it takes a lot of time to braise them. I like braising, it just takes a lot, a lot of time. And then I'll just leave them in buckets. And you know, that I think that's my favorite part about my job. Here's the secret, I like just, you know, I know you guys all wanna know. That way, when you go to use your tool, you have to move them all. It makes you really happy, you know? Good thing I cut all those out that one day and spent six hours folding them just because you might need them someday, you know? Good thing I made a bunch of nickel, nickel silver bell patterns too. I need my new shot. I need it to be done. Yeah, there's a failed horn bend. Don't ask me what happened. So, we finished roll, rolling the bells. I just went ahead and uncreased them because we remember we intentionally creased them so that uh, the roller wouldn't make actual creases. We got one left to do. This one's already been opened up. This is opened up in the front, in the flare, I should say, which is good. What we need to do now is just round out the tail a little bit. We're not getting it perfect at this point. There's no need to right now because it's going to go on a mandrel anyways. I have it right now on a French horn tail mandrel, uh, a hammering mandrel, not a drawing mandrel. You don't want to hammer on drawing mandrels, just kind of, it's just not something I like doing. It feels wrong. Especially when you make your own drawing mandrel, it's like, it doesn't feel right. So what we're just going to do is we're going to hit on the corners of our rectangle here and we're just going to balloon it out to like an ovalish. That looks good to me. So we just rounded it out just a little bit, just to get it so that when we go to the power hammer, we aren't going to like be holding onto it back here and just have it go which has happened to me and it really sucks. Got my O2O, this is for my first double horn. I've made a few, but none of them are like the ones I wanna sell. I have the whole thing modeled in the computer and kinda what I wanna do, but I haven't put it down to brass yet, so this is the first step to doing it. Maybe we'll do some videos on it, like how to make a double horn, not just like putting stuff together, but how to think about making a double horn, how to think for like idiots, for John. He's not an idiot. John's actually really smart. We counted, John has had 11 cars in his four years of driving cars. It's kind of insane. Just a little fun fact about our boy John. So the other bells I just did are 016, and that refers to the decimal thickness. This is an 020. 016 is not common. It's a kind of historical weight. Most early instruments before 19 something, I mean, I'm not gonna throw fake dates. The Most of the Vienna horns you'll see up until modern Vienna horns are thicker now because it's easier to work with, are gonna be that smaller. Uh, in metric, it's 0.4 millimeter. It's very thin, very hard to work with. That's what these three are. This one's an O2O, which is kind of what I consider to be the modern standard and what all bells, if you don't know what you're looking for specifically about a bell thickness, it's what all bells should be. It's a, uh, close to 0.5 millimeter. My German friends tell me it's kind of the standard from like a, a Bernstander bell or a Meinl. But that being said, a lot of German horn bells are 0.45 millimeter. I should say the tails, like the bell tail, I'll put it in the blur, are 0.45 millimeter, which is 018 brass. And that really bothers me because we just can't fucking get it here. Like, unobtainium. If anyone has a wide belt sander or a drum sander, like for woodworking, that I could come visit you and try some stuff on. Uh, if it if I destroy it, I will buy you a brand new one. I don't give a shit. I'll buy you as many rolls of the sandpaper as you want. I want to try taking O2O brass like bell patterns and running them through there and thinning it down to 018 because that would make my life so much better. Send me an email at this email address. Looks good to me. To the power hammer. Okay. Oh, I've got to turn the air compressor on. Bye. I was so close to messing it up. So you'll see, it looks a lot worse than it is. So yeah, I'll be able to fix that. It's not overlapped like at all. It just has a rounded up curve there. That could have been really depressing. Usually when you're like, oh, I only need two bells, so I'll make a third one immediately you f up the third one. That's just the way it goes. I'll probably do one more round of power hammering on it, but you can see how coned it is. That's what you're looking for. Let me fix this crease. So to fix a crease when you get one, what we're gonna do is first we're gonna kneel it, so. 
Okay, so you not only want to anneal on the crease, but obviously around it, because all that metal is going to stretch. And this one should be pretty easy. We're just going to put the post anvil in the vise and get the nose right under that crease and just try to push it up. So in, in instrument repair, there's a term called rebounding, where like you hold the horn on a rod with a ball or something, and then you have someone to take a hammer and hit the rod. Honestly, I've never done that in repair. I don't do that much anymore, but even when I did as a job, I didn't do that as repair. It seems kind of crazy. I get it for saxophones, because they're so thick. I think that's where a lot of people do it, but people ask me if that would work for here, and I'm like, sure. Or you could just, you know, push it with your hands and just like uncrease it. If you ever have a crease that's like fully folded and even a little bit sharp on where the fold is, it's garbage. Don't try to braise it. Don't try to hammer it and just like forget about it because it will show up again. Don't try to silver solder it. Don't braise it with bronze. Just trash it. If you're learning how to make bells and this is like, oh no, it's my last piece of brass. I don't have any money in my bank to buy more. Then sure, braise it and keep going. Don't sell that bell or don't use that bell. It's not even unethical, it's just, it brings your quality like standard down so much. Every time I've done it, I've regretted it, so don't do it. So, it's not fully rolled. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start at the part of the crease that's the most non-creased, okay? That's up here. And we're gonna get the nose of the anvil right under, obviously from the inside, but right under here and just push up. And I'll do one or two pushes and then I'll show you what happens. You can see I got just about a third of the crease off. Gonna keep going. And then once you get it up enough, you're gonna hammer it flat. But there's a specific way to do that, so don't just go swing it. Okay, so you might say, hey Miles, that still looks creased. It's not, it's just bubbled, is what I would say right now. What you're gonna do now is you're gonna hammer the crease flat. Okay, we're not gonna fold it over, we're gonna hammer it flat. The trick here is you wanna make sure that there's space between the bell and the whatever anvil rod you're hammering on. If there isn't space between the crease and the anvil, you will fold it over. This one probably not, is not too aggressive, but if you're working with anything a little bit bigger. What you wanna do is you wanna hold it off the mandrel, you wanna have this touching the mandrel up here, and this tilted off a bit, probably about a quarter inch. And then you're gonna take a rawhide or a nylon hammer, nothing, not steel. Hear how it's hollow back here, and hear how it's not back here. Okay, you wanna hit on the hollow because what you're gonna do, you take that crease that's like this, say that my thumb down here is the anvil, tell them to draw a picture or something, and you're gonna hammer the crease so it's like this, and then it's gonna hammer it again until it's like that. So it's gonna take that brass and spread it out. So, a little bit of space, and now there's no more crease. You can see, the only evidence of the crease is the light from where the carbon has broken off. But that is not folded and that won't be any issue. So when you see white like sparkling around the thing, that's stretch marks. And on O2O it's not a big deal, but on O16 like this, it starts getting to the point where it's a big deal. As long as you can avoid that, you'll be pretty golden. Man, this is banger of a YouTube video right here. We are going to anneal these four and then we're going to do a power hammer one more time, smooth them out and then we'll put them on a mandrel and try to round the tails out a bit and then we'll go inside spin. So something that is kind of cool, just another little talking thing here. For my trumpet bells, I just made this mandrel. And this mandrel is probably the thing that I've been thinking about for the longest and putting off doing for the longest. It is the best thing I've ever done. This is a bell mandrel just for the trumpet bell pattern. When you braise a trumpet bell, it looks like that. And then when you roll a trumpet bell, it looks like that. This mandrel helps you go from the rolled seam pattern after the back is broken. This is, does not bake, break the back. We don't want it to. It helps you go from that to this. And you might say, hey, that just looks like a bell in process. It does, but it's also identical to all the other bells in process, okay? This is process reliability, because before, I didn't have a mandrel that fit the tail, didn't have a mandrel that fit the flare like this. Some factories have two, where they'll have a tail like this and a flare like this. I said that was dumb, why not just have one and all the blanks are identical. And I'm not spinning on this, I'm not drawing these, I'm just burnishing with rollers really quick and hammering the flare really quick. And that gets me this, which is legit. This will go in the lathe and it'll get inside spun, and when this time time comes to fit this to a mandrel, our tail is already perfectly round and our flare is on the same axis as our tail. So it's like saves so much time and so much failure. I got a whole stack of them done over there that I put on this mandrel and I could not be more excited about it. The reason I'm talking about this is I need to make one for my French horn pattern 
but obviously that's a lot bigger of a mandrel to make and I don't have the steel for it. But what I do have is another bell mandrel. What I've done before is you just kind of get through the inside spinning and then fit the tail after, which I don't like because it has reliability issues. See this mandrel? It's less cone shaped, more flared, but I'm wondering if that's gonna get me pretty close to get it. This is the mandrel that the old one sixes are going on. I made that one. And then this is the mandrel that my double horn's going on. That's is, this is a copy of the old Skyer. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna try and see if I can get this mandrel to work for this. I might have to turn off like the edge here or something. I'm not doing that today, but we'll probably just slap it down on one of these guys today and round it out as best we can. Okay, so we got him annealed again. Before I go do another round on the hammer, I wanna look at one thing. On the seams, we really don't care about if the outside has anything still on it. They're, they're really, really close to being smooth. If you have like any spots like up here at the tip of the bell, I use one notch. And all that does is while I'm brazing it, it helps the bell stay together and not flex out of the way. That ends up getting cut off, but it's helpful to have it smoothed out as well as you can. So this one might not need anything. Maybe a tiny bit. There seems to be some bleed on the inside with the braze. Just a little bit there. So like this one, we got this spot here, which has just had a clump of braze that I couldn't get filed off of there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna touch it up with a hammer on the close end. You don't need a seam roller to make a bell. You can do it all with a hammer. It's a lot easier with a butt seam than a lap seam for sure. Seam roller just makes it way more consistent, but you do end up touching up spots, which is okay. So you just wanna make sure that it's smooth on the inside. You get that glassy look on the outside like we did when we get rolled a seam. This hammer, I get a lot of questions about. This is the cheapest hammer you could probably buy. It's just a ball peen hammer. This one's from Harbor Freight. I have spent a lot of money on hammers and they all suck and then I spend two dollars at a hammer and it's pretty good. What I did though is, is I reground the face. You get them and they'll be perfectly round. I put a curve going this way and that is so that when I'm coming down on the, the bell, I'm not going to dig my edges in here but I'm going to dig my edges in here. That's what's actually contacting is that strip down the middle. Looks good to me. Nice and smooth. Yeah, basically all you're doing when you're hammering on it is you're looking at the really yellow spots. So you can see there's the darker spots now. Those are where the hammer's been. And the yellow spots are where the hammer hasn't touched. When you're hammering the seams, you want to hit the raised yellow spots. And you don't want to hit the fucking living crap out of it, but you want to you wanna smooth it out. We are going to do one last round on the hammer and then we are inside spinning. That was fun. You like that? I like that. We got our cones. So now we are going to round out the, the throats a bit. I'm gonna use this mandrel, but in a vise. And then we're gonna get ready to inside spin, which is my favorite part.